had, we had finished up in chapter chapter 2 and verse 1, which really fits in better with the first chapter. Of course, chapter and verse divisions are not inspired by God. They're just added after the fact to to kind of aid us in finding our ways our way around in the Bible. And so uh, here we are in, in Hosea chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 2. We're going to read actually on through the end of the chapter, because all of this goes together. And we'll begin reading in verse 2. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. <clears throat> Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was first born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot, she, hath, she that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge upon thy way, or I will, I will hedge up thy ways with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me, for then it was better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof, and I will recover my wool and my flax <clears throat> given to cover her nakedness. And now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the fields shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. And she decked herself with her earrings uh, and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, said the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort comfortably to her. And I will give her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, said the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt Call me no more Bali, for I will take away the names of Balim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow of, and the sword and, and of the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, said the Lord. I will hear the heavens, and they, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy on her that hath not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. Father, I thank you for your word, thank you for what we've read here and the truth of it, and I pray here tonight as we enter into, uh, enter into the preaching of your word that you would help me as I speak to speak your truth in love and in, and in, uh, and in accuracy to your text. And we pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit that you, would, that you would drive it home in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, have, for family vacations, we, we like to go out west. We've done that several years. We took our first camping trip and went to New Mexico and camped in the desert. And it did not take us long camping in the desert to find out that everything in the desert wants to hurt you or kill you, even the plants. The plants, everything is spiky and spiny. There's thorns all over everything in the desert. Um, and because I know what thorns are like, my attention is arrested when I read a phrase like the one found in verse 6, where God said, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. What does that phrase mean? 
Um, well, basically, Hosea chapter 2 prevents, uh, or presents a, a metaphor in which God presents Israel as his wife. That is, the nation of Israel is pictured as God's wife. And the individual Israelites who live in the nation are the children. So you have a mother, a wife, children in this metaphor. All right? And the wife has committed serial adultery, even to the point of multiplied prostitutions. And, and the wife is continuing to go her way. She is once... This is really hot, isn't it? I'm just going to... That's bothering me, so I'm going I'm to turn this back on. There we go. I can't even concentrate on what I'm doing. Every S sounds like uh, nails on a chalkboard. So, All right. So in the metaphor, uh, the wife Israel is continuing to go her own way. And she is once again walking down her path, seeking out another liaison with one of her paramours. And, but her husband is, in this picture, not going to take it any longer. He's going to do something about it. Uh, and he's going to put a stop to it. So he does something to make sure that she cannot walk down this path to her lover's house again. He blocks off the road to the house with thorns. And all the paths to all of her lover's houses, there's multiple lovers here, all the paths are now walled off with thorns. Um, and she cannot pass by. She cannot find her lovers any longer and this is just several, one of several ways in which the Lord pursues his erring wife. God pursues his people throughout the Old Testament. We, if you just read through the Old Testament, you'll see that in, in the narrative. God pursuing his people. And he does so here in our text. And when God pursues his people, and we read about that, and we see that even in real life, how should we react to God pursuing his people? How does that affect us? Now consider that when God pursues his people, we are his people, right? Uh, and that is, believers in Christ are God's people. We're adopted. We are his children. We are, we are brought into fellowship with him. We are a kingdom of priests. We are his peculiar treasure. And so now the church is not Israel, though. We're reading about Israel. And when you read the Old Testament, you need to understand that the church is not Israel, and a lot of people get mixed up on that. But that makes interpreting the book of Hosea a little bit difficult. But even though the church is not Israel, um, <clears throat> God pursued Israel, and we serve the same God. We are people of the same God. And so God is not different now than he was during the Old Testament times. So how he pursues Israel should have an effect on, on us in our relationship with him. So I want to consider this subject, how must we react to God's pursuit of his people? And the fact is that God does not let us go. We preached this morning about God abandoning a society. God does not abandon his people. Uh, and so even though in, uh, in the book of Hosea, we're going to see God abandon Israel, but the people he abandons are not his people. Uh, and, and then later on, he brings them back to himself. But I want to consider this subject, how we react when God pursues his people. And I want to go about it under two headings. Basically, one is that God pursues his people with positive actions. And secondly, we must be moved to action by God's action. So we'll consider those two topics, so, or those two statements of the topic. And first of all, God pursues his people with positive actions. Um, in other words, God is active. There's nothing done by accident. There's nothing done capriciously, positively, planning, active, he is pursuing his people. Let me list you for you three positive actions that God uses to pursue his people. Uh, one is that God punishes to produce repentance. When he's pursuing his people, this is the positive action. God punishes in order to produce re repentance when dealing with his people. Hosea announced um, to an affluent and successful society that they were going to be severely punished by the Lord. And, and because, here's the problem, they're practicing syncretistic religion. That just means that they 
take the worship of God and they add other stuff to it. They add Baal to it, they add, add Ashtoreth to it, or Molech or whoever else they could get into there, and they just add other things to their worship of God. And so they and, and also they gave Baal credit for all the good things that God had done for them. In verse 5 of Hosea 2, it says, um, for their mother hath played the harlot, she hath conceived them, hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers, that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. She said, they, they're giving me this stuff. That's payment from them. And, and, but that was what God had given to them. Uh, and so God's going to punish them to, per, to, to uh, bring about repentance because they were openly and wickedly living in sinful behavior. Um, now, the punishment of God that, that God would bring on Israel is metaphorically depicted as uh, there's a picture given to us, a jealous husband publicly shaming his adulterous wife. In verse 3, we get that picture. He said, um, this, is the, this is the danger she's in. He said, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day when she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her in her dry land and slay her with thirst. Um, and so there's a bit of a mixed metaphor there. And verse 10 kind of brings out the same picture. He says, and now, I will, now will I discover uh, her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. Um, and so the picture is really pretty graphic, but it is of a jealous husband, and I don't know exactly what the customs would have been in that day, but he basically shames his adulterous wife in the presence of her of her illicit lovers by stripping her naked and letting everybody gawk at her, I guess. I don't know if that would be, now God's not really literally doing this to a person. It is a, it is a metaphor. Uh, but I, I don't know what the point of that would be other than I think that the illicit lovers that she had been with have no compassion on her. They point and laugh. And that's, that's the point. There is no compassion for her. This is, this is the punishment that God metaphorically is bringing upon Israel. And that would bear out in reality. Israel went after Assyria, and Israel went after Egypt, and Israel went after Babylon, and tried to make treaties with them, and tried to get backdoor deals going with them instead of trusting the Lord. And then when Israel was in trouble, Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, they pointed and laughed. They, they came and they took the treasure. They, they, they attacked. They did not have any compassion on Israel. So what God pictures metaphorically actually happened in real time. But God's punishment in reality is, is, is twofold. Uh, one is alienation from the foreign nations from which Israel sought to receive material blessings and protection. Um, and, they, and like I said, they'd gone after Assyria, they'd gone after uh, Egypt and other places to, to uh, join in with them. And then they would be alienated from the false gods that Israel had worshipped. Baal, in particular, was a fertility god and God's punishment is going to be taking away the crops. It's going to alienate them from the supposed um, benefits that Baal would bring. And so the practical result would be an absolute devastation of the country. They're living high at the time that this prophecy is given. Economy's booming, um, politics going well, they're at peace with their neighbors, uh, but in the near future, God is going to destroy their economy in verse 9, it says, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and I will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. So corn and, and wine and, and um, wool and flax, those are the necessities. Those are the, those are the things that come from their agrarian society. And God's going to destroy their economy. And then God's also going to destroy their cultural rituals in life. Verse 11, he says, I will also cause her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and her solemn feasts. He's listed there several rituals that are public things, pe things that the society does. If, if we could maybe uh, bring, make an analogy to, to our culture, uh, it would be kind of like God saying, I'm going to take away the 4th of July, I'm going to take away Thanksgiving, I'm going to take away Christmas and Easter, and, uh, and you guys... Wait a second, that sounds way too familiar from last year, right? Um, but basically, God is saying all of these things that you do that bring you together as a people that you enjoy, this is what you organize your life around, I'm going to take that away. When I was a, when I was a kid, we used to have a stupid saying, you know, if someone told you to do something or else, you'd say, what are you going to do, take away my birthday? You guys remember that from the early 90s? 
Only us, huh? Okay. Well, it was dumb. What are you going to do? Take away my birthday? Like, you couldn't do that, I guess. Um, and God is saying, I will do that. Um, it's going to take away from them all of these things that are their cultural norms and cultural... And, and by the way, these, these feasts and things are all feasts that, that, were, that were made by God for them to worship him, and they had taken them and perverted them. And that was more like a cultural worship than an actual worship. Now, to what purpose would God do all these things to Israel? Well, he would do it to produce a reaction in that nation. He did these things to produce repentance. Israel was God's wife. And, and Israel was to come to her senses and forsake her illicit lovers and return to faithfulness to her real husband, who was Yahweh, who was God. In verses 6 and 7, um, the Bible says, Therefore, behold, I will hedge thy way in with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And then, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. And then, so that's all the stuff that's going to happen as God punishes her, her. And then here's the result. Then she shall say, then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. God is trying to get her attention, to get her to return to him, or to get her to start thinking about repentance. And before that would happen, the Lord, though, be, before the national repentance could happen, the Lord called on individual Israelites, individuals out of the crowd, to denounce Israel. That is, God metaphorically called uh, uh, Israel their mother and said that she is no longer his wife. If you go back to verse 2, um, he says, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. So God makes that statement. And, and here's the important, important point of the whole metaphor here, uh, which this metaphor presents the Israelite people themselves, the individual people, as illegitimate claimants to the title people of God. The culture of Israel, particular its, particularly its political and religious leadership, is, is metaphorically presented as the prostitute mother of the Israelite people. So you have the culture and the people, basically. All right, you get the leadership and the prevailing culture and the mass uh, of, the, of, of Israel as a whole, and then you've got God talking to individual people. And God calls on the children to denounce their mother. It says, plead with your mother. Plead. The children must repudiate the behavior of their mother. She has been shameful, and, uh, and, and she has been um, unfaithful, and God calls on them to denounce her. And they must find fault with or contend against to denounce their mother. The word plead here in verse 2, that's what it means, to denounce or to repudiate. Um, and Hosea is saying that they must set themselves apart from their mother, lest they suffer the same fate that she suffers. Um, and so moving away from the metaphor, so you have this metaphor, uh, an adulterous mother, her children, and God is calling out on them to denounce her. And we move away from that metaphor, what does it practically mean? Well, it means that God is seeking repentance from individual Israelites as he is about to judge the whole nation. All right, so there's a judgment coming on the whole nation, and individual Israelites are being called to repentance. They would re express their repentance by denouncing Israel, by pleading against their mother, so to speak. And so he says, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, let, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land to slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be children of whoredoms. For their mother hath played the harlot, she hath conceived them, she that conceived them have, have done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my wine, or are my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. So God punishes these people, but he's doing so first as he's calling them to repentance, calling individual Israelites. Um, now that's how he pursues his people, by acting in order to produce repentance. 
Um, let's look at a second way. God addresses, God acts to, to uh, pursue his people, and he does that this way. God addresses sin to produce forgiveness. God addresses sin to produce forgiveness. In verse 14, he says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort comfortably unto her. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, here is a flash forward and a flash back at the same time. God flashes forward to the day that that he is going to win back the heart of his wife, his bride, Israel. He's going to win her back. God also flashes back to the day when Israel was first unfaithful to him coming out of the land or coming into the land of Canaan. So let's consider first the flashback. Verse 15 says that God will give Israel the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Now what is the valley of Achor and why does that pro provide hope? Well, the valley of Achor was the place where Israel was first unfaithful to the Lord as, as they came into Canaan and where the Lord first put away Israel's sin in the land of Canaan. When they conquered Jericho, God strictly forbade Israel from taking spoil from that city. They were going to destroy the entire city and they were not supposed to take any of the, any of the loot from the, from the city. That was all to be wholly dedicated to the Lord. But one of Israel's soldiers named Achan violated God's command and took some of the spoil and he hid it in his tent. Of course, later on, Israel went to battle with a small town named Ai and they got cocky. They only sent a few of their soldiers there because they said it's so small and they lost the battle. Devastated by the defeat, they sought the Lord and God said there's sin in the camp. Somebody has sinned in taking the accursed thing. And so they, they, uh, they, they assemble in, in, in the day and, and God points out that it's Achan. So Israel stoned Achan. They marked his grave with a pile of rocks and the location was named the Valley of Achor. Achor means trouble as a memorial, Joshua 7.26. When Achan's sin was exposed by the Lord, God commanded that sin to be addressed and to be removed from the nation. And so the valley of Achor was the valley of trouble to Israel. And, and, and even, even these Israelites who had strayed so far from the Lord would have been familiar with the story of Achan. Now, let's flash forward. That's the flashback. Let's flash forward. God's grace reverses the meaning of Achor. Instead of signifying punishment for greed, it has become a place of restoration. God, uh, I believe God uses Achor to point out that he will deal with Israel's sin, putting it away, and producing the means of forgiveness. And so ultimately, this is done by Christ in the New co Covenant. Here is God changing the valley of Achor from trouble to hope, from, from something dark in the past to a door of hope for his people. So God pursues his people by addressing sin, and he's going to bring about forgiveness in the, in the nation's life, and that's going to be done through Christ, but forgiveness only comes by addressing sin that's been committed. And so God pursues his people by, first of all, um, acting to produce, punishing to produce repentance, and then... Uh, addressing sin to produce forgiveness. And now, thirdly, God pursues his people. God gives promises to produce restoration. Promises to produce respiration, <laughs> respiration, <laughs> restoration. All right. Uh, I want to remind you that God promised a new covenant to his people. Um, in the prophet Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, outlines the new covenant. He said, Behold, I... Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach 
No more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. It is through the new covenant that we Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree of God's people. Um, and, and it is God's new covenant by which he restores his wife, Israel to himself. The prophetic formula that looks to the future day of the new covenant is given in the statement in that day or at that day. That appears three times, verse 16, verse 18, and verse 21. You see that over and over again, in that day, in that day, in that day. The restoration of Israel um, is something future in that day, that day coming. And, and it produces several results in Hosea's prophecy here. Um, the restoration of Israel does. Israel first of all, will no longer flirt with other gods. Idolatry is going to be in that day completely gone from, from the people. In verse 16, <clears throat> it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. For I will take the, away the names of the Balim out of her mouth, and they will no more be remembered by their name. So God will restore peace and perfection and uh, and, and, and he's going to, well, first of all, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Idolatry is going to be completely taken out of, their, out of their vernacular, out of their mouths, out of their hearts. And there he says right there, you will no longer use this name, Baalim. God will restore the peace and perfection of creation that existed before the fall. All the effects of sin will be gone. The animals will no longer be dangerous. And there will never again be a threat of war, he says. In that day, verse 18, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the air and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword of battle out on the earth and will make them to lie down safely. There will never again be a shortfall in the food production as the crops will produce abundantly, verses 21 and 22. So there's there's peace with the animals. There's peace with people. There's, there's um, peace with creation. But more importantly... God states that he will restore Israel to relationship with himself and he will restore Israel to a more intimate relationship with himself than they have ever known before. He's going to marry Israel in the new covenant. And he expresses that in verses 19 and 20. He says, And I will betroth thee unto me. Here's another repeated word. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. He is going to bring them into a relationship that they have never quite known with him. By the way, we get to be in that relationship too because we are involved in the new covenant. Now, God will mercifully make Israel his people again. That's the last result of this restoration. Verse 23, and I will sow her in the earth, sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that hath not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which are not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say thou art my God. So God pursues people through positive actions, not by accident. It's intentional. And he punishes to produce repentance. That's one of his intentional actions. He addresses sin to produce forgiveness. Before the foundation of the world, Christ's death on the cross was planned. And then he gives promises to produce restoration in planning the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ on the cross before the foundation of the world. God was already planning the new covenant, even before he made the old one. And he pursues his people that way. And, and we serve the same God who spoke this to Israel. So, how must we react to God's pursuit? What does this have to do with us? What should it produce in us? Well, we must be moved to action by God's actions. How must we react to these pursuits of God? Well, one is this. One action we could, we could say we need to move to is this. We must denounce the sins of our culture. God called on individual Israelites, the children, to denounce their mother, right? Now again, the church is not Israel. And so I don't know if this correlates directly. Um, but I do think that God would call on us to denounce the sins of our culture. We did a little bit of that this morning. Um, but we don't do it with joy and, and, and 
grave dancing or anything like that, but we, we are called by God to denounce the sins of our culture, to speak out truth in light in the darkness. And as he called out individual Israelites to call out to denounce their culture. Secondly, how must we be moved by God's actions? Um, we must treasure the grace of God given to us. In verses 14 and 15, God's grace is all over that. He takes the valley of Achor, something tragic, the death of a man, where sin was, where, where sin was addressed and put away. And yet God took the death of a man, not a guilty man, but an innocent man, Jesus, and put our sins away. And we ought to always treasure that. That ought to be uh, the, the one thing that we never forget about every day. Like every day we ought to treasure the grace of God, treasure the forgiveness that we have in Him. There are so many things we might be tempted to treasure. Our possessions, our positions, um, maybe even other people in our lives. Not all of it's bad. But the thing that we ought to treasure most is that our sins are forgiven. God addressed our sins and put them away. And that treasuring of that grace that God has given to us will help us, will spurn us on to, to forgive others, uh, to to love others as, as God loves them. And so we must treasure the grace of God to us. And then thirdly, how must we be moved to action by God's actions is this. We must consider what demands our hopes of the future make upon the present. We have a future hope. It's, a, it's in heaven, right? We have, we have a hope of the future, but that hope implies certain things about the present and makes demands upon us in the present. I want to point you back to verses 16 and 17. There's, there God made a promise to his people that he would one day completely eradicate all mention of false gods from the lips of his people. It shall be in that day, verse 16, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt, no, shalt call me no more Bali. For I will say, for I will take away the names of Balim out of her mouth and they shall no more be remembered by their name. So Ishi, what does that mean? Well, it's not a sushi dish, all right? Uh, Ishi means my husband, all right? And what does Bali mean? Well, Bali means my Lord, all right? And what does Balim mean? That is just plural for Baal or Baal. It's really pronounced Baal, but nobody likes that. So, um, but uh, so anyway, that's that just means there's there was a pantheon. There were several gods and demigods that went by these names, and it was most likely here Baal, 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 whatever, uh, has the meaning of my Lord. Well, so does. Yahweh also means that God was Lord over his people. And it was most likely that the Israelites justified their syncretist, syncretistic worship of Baal by equating him in some way with the Lord. They could say, I'm worshiping the Lord, and they could mean Baal and Yahweh at the same time. You see what they're doing there? Um, they could play word games. And so they could pretend to worship both at once or in some way at least equate the two and pacify all sides. But God's future promise was that pure worship in the future would be purged of the term Baal. So you, you try to justify its use, but in the future it's not going to be used because I don't like it. So that future promise implies that the present generation was forbidden to use the term also. Hopes of the future make a, depend, a demand on the present. And in the same way, we look forward to the promise of heaven with great anticipation. Uh, but that future promise makes de demands on our present life, doesn't it? We are right to speak of streets of gold and mansions and joy and glory and reunions with loved ones. And, and we are also justified when we speak of what will not be there. Death and pain and sorrow and, tear and tears and disease. But remember what kind of place heaven is. It is God's place. It is a place that, where Christ went to prepare for us. It is a place where God is. And Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3 describes the scene of his throne room. 
uh, where it says, one cried to another, one angel crying to another, and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is the God who presently commands us to be holy because he is holy. This is a future hope that makes a present demand upon us. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 puts it this way, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. John, the apostle, is looking forward to heaven. He's looking forward to being transported into perfection and into the joy of the Lord. He's looking forward to getting that new resurrection body, right? Wouldn't that, won't that be great to have the new resurrection body? All the aches and pains gone, right? Uh, you, you will stand up in the morning and not hear Rice Krispies going off, right? Um, and you will not if you don't hear the Rice Krispies going off, it hurts, right? <laughs> so, uh, you you know, that's going to be gone. You're, you're going to be able to remember people's names when you talk to them, <laughs> right? And uh, you're going to be halfway through a sentence, and you're going to remember where you were going with that sentence, right? Halfway through a sermon, remembering where you're going with that. Um, anyway, there's going to be... A, a wonderful transformation that takes place and John looks forward to that he says we're gonna be like him we're there's gonna be a change happening for we're gonna see him as he is that's the future hope but then he makes a present claim from that future hope every man that hath this hope in him in him uh, in him purifies himself even as he is pure that future hope makes a claim on my present life so we have a door of hope the valley of Achor in Jesus Christ. God redeemed that valley for Israel. That reality must not only anchor our hope in the future, but also must captivate our hearts and our actions in the present. And so this, this picture, this metaphor, this, this story we see of God and his people, Israel, calls us really uh, not, to, not to make some kind of great declaration or some kind of uh, a big decision here, but it calls us maybe on a Sunday night to where on a Thursday afternoon this week when you're tempted by one thing or another to remember you have a future hope and it calls for your loyalty, it calls for a present claim on your life, uh, not just in the big moments of life, but in the every.